All right. Let's start with a show of hands of those of you who would like to be even more successful than you already are. Okay, right. We start with the no-brainer stuff, right? We start with the easy stuff. Okay. Let's see a show of hands of those of you who would like to hear the word no more often. Yeah, it's pretty good. We got about half the room. Uh, let's see a show of hands of those of you who are going to refuse to raise your hand today no matter what we ask. Okay, not a bad start. Now, Tupac gave it away just a little bit. People usually wonder when they don't know in advance, when Richard and I walk out on stage, what is the deal with these two? Are they married or what? And yes, of course, we are in fact married, which is actually a go for no story in and of itself. Yeah. I asked Andrea to marry me every day for over a year. I'm talking over 400 times in all. And every time I asked her, she said, no. no. And then one day, we're walking through a Macy's department store, and I did, I guess what you'd call a throwaway proposal. I said, are you going to marry me or what? And she said, yes. Now, I was so used to her saying no that at first it didn't even register. And then I realized she had just agreed to marry me, so I ran over to the jewelry department. I bought the ring. I ran over to the shoe department where I found her sitting in a chair, okay, with a sales associate kneeling in front of her, sliding a Donna Karen pump on her foot. I knelt down next to the sales associate, did a formal proposal. It was all very romantic. Yes, it was. It was shoes and jewelry at the same time, ladies. You know what I'm talking about. Now, people assume that because we're known as the go-for-no people that we must somehow be so fearless. And interestingly, nothing could be further from the truth, which is why Richard is going to start by sharing with all of you his very rough start in sales. Right. My first job in the world of sales was working for my father in the automotive fleet industry. That's the sale of corporate vehicles, right? Renting cars, leasing cars. And I'd been working for my dad for a couple of years, and one day he calls me into the office, and he says, Richard, he says, I've got some great news. I said, what's that? He said, it's time to join the big boys. I said, what does that mean? He said, it means you're going into sales. He said, effective today, he said, you are the Midwestern Regional Fleet Sales Manager for Long Chevrolet here in Chicago. We have an office set up for you downstairs. Your name is on the door. Your phone is hooked up. Your business cards are printed. And he said, and sitting on the middle of the desk is a phone book for you to look for prospects to cold call on. And then he gave me the four-word sales training program. He said, go get them, Tiger. <laughs> well, I went down to this office with no sales training at all, having no idea what I was doing. And I sat in that office for a month. I'm talking a full 30 days. And you want to take a guess as to how many calls I made? Zero. I never dialed the phone. And you know why? It was really simple. You see, I could tell that just by looking at the prospects' names in the phone book, I could tell that just by looking at their names printed on the paper in the phone book, that it was the wrong psychological moment to interrupt them. I had a fear of failure. I had a fear of rejection. I certainly didn't think my message, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, from, I'm from a car dealer. I've got some cars to sell you. I didn't think my message was as important whatever else it was that these people had going on. Well, I realized I was going to have to do something. So I went back to my dad, and I want you to imagine how difficult this was. Here is a 20-something son going to his sales legend father and having to say, I can't sell. Now, interestingly, my dad took it pretty well. He said, Richard, he said, I really didn't give you any sales training. He says, come on in here. He said, let's make some calls together. Well, let's make some calls together really meant that he was going to make some calls, and I was going to sit on the other side of the desk, and I was going to listen in. Hang on one second, folks. So I want you to imagine. Here I am sitting on the side of the desk. My dad's on the other side. My dad grabs his phone book. He flips through the phone book. 
He finds the rent-a-car page. He runs his finger down the page. He goes, here we go, ABC rent-a-car. He goes, I've never called on these people before. Let's give them a call. My dad dials the phone. Yes, purchasing, please. Sure, I'll hold. He gets the purchasing agent on the phone. And within three minutes, he has a sale for 20 cars. And I have to tell you, that was the moment that I decided to quit the car business. <laughs> I knew I couldn't do what he had done. At least I didn't think I could. You see, my father was the quintessential sales natural. He was the person who could start a conversation with anyone, anywhere, anytime about anything. He didn't have to think about it. He didn't need steps. He didn't need a process. He just did it. In that regard, I am not my father's son. I needed the steps. I needed the training. I needed the somebody to show me what came first, what came second, right? Well, when I say that was the moment I decided to quit the car business, I'm not saying it as a laugh line. I'm saying it because that was, I thought at the time, my only way out. I quit my job. I moved from Chicago all the way to Los Angeles to get as far away from the car business as I possibly could. And when I got to LA, interestingly, the first job I took was in sales. But this time, you see, I thought I'd solve the problem. Because this time, I took a job in the world of retail sales. You see, I thought in the world of retail, I wouldn't have the same problems. I thought in the world of retail, people would be driving up, parking their car, walking in, and I would just take care of them, and all my problems would go away. There would be no conversations with strangers. Well, you know what? Two months later, I find myself in the same situation. I am failing again. And then the miracle happened. The miracle was that I met a man named Harold. I'd been working in this new job. My sales were so abysmal, abysmal, I was pretty sure they were going to fire me. And then I heard this district manager was coming in. I thought, maybe if I could impress Harold on the store visit, maybe they would give me some more time to improve my sales. Well, Harold came in. We had donuts and coffee. The store opened up at 10 o'clock. Because I was the first one in that morning, I got the first up. I got to take care of the first customer. In walks this very well-dressed gentleman who says, I need to buy an entire wardrobe of clothing. And I thought, you know what? This is it. This is my magical moment. This is the moment where I'm going to show Harold what a great salesperson I can be. And for the next half hour, I took care of this gentleman. He bought a suit, sport coat, shirts, ties, shoes, socks, belt, pocket square, collar pin, underwear. I mean, he bought an entire wardrobe of clothing. The sale came to $1,100. I thought I was really cool. I thought I'd knocked it out of the park. I send the customer on his way. I come back in, and I am waiting for Harold to fall all over me and tell me how fabulous I am. And instead, he asked me a question that would change the course of my life. He said, Richard, out of curiosity, he said, what did that last customer say no to? And I said, what are you talking about? Were you not watching the sale I just had? That man just bought $1,100 worth of clothing. He bought a suit. He bought a sport coat. He, I started running through the list of everything he'd purchased. Harold said, whoa, stop. He said, I'm not asking you what he said yes to. He said, yes is always the easy part of any sale. You just take the sales check. You look at everything that's listed there. Those are the yeses. He said, that has been established. He said, the question I am asking you right now is what did that customer say no to? And when I stopped and I reviewed the sale in my mind from beginning to end, I realized that that customer hadn't said no to anything. Every single thing I laid in front of that man, he purchased. I said, Harold, he didn't say no to anything. And then Harold asked me the other really great question. He said, then how did you know he was done? Well, let me tell you how I knew he was done. I was a young guy. I wasn't making a lot of money. I didn't have a fat wallet at the time. You came into my store, and you got to my mental spending limit? You were done. <laughs> if, you, if you spent $1,000, which is about the most I'd ever spent on clothing at that time in my life, you were done. I wrapped up the sale. I sent you on your way. Harold said, you know, Richard, he said, I watched you sell, kid. And he said, you know what? He said, you're not half bad. And then he said, but your fear of the word no is going to kill you. He said, but you know what? I've got a feeling that if you can just get over that, 
He said, I think you're going to become one of the great ones. And it was amazing because I went to the work that morning afraid they were going to fire me. And I went home that night, two letters from greatness, N-O, no. I thought, I could do that. I could go back into the store in the next day and I could show more products. I could offer more services. I could take more chances. I could upsell a little bit. And I made the decision that I was going to fail my way to success. Did it work? Yes, thank you, please. Now the question is, did it work? Well, I'm not gonna tell you that I became an award-winning salesperson overnight, because that took a whole year. <laughs> but all because one person took the time to explain to me that the model of failure and success that I was operating with was the wrong model. Harold said everybody's got two different models. He says they have a model where they think of themselves. Let me get our slide here. Here we go. The model where they think of themselves as having themselves in the middle and they've got failure on one side, they've got success on the other side, right? And they think that their job is to avoid failure while simultaneously trying to move towards success. Harold said, that's the model that is guaranteed to lead you to a mediocre lifestyle. He said, the model you want to be operating with is the one where you're over here and failure, rejection, having people say no to you is here, and the success that you want so bad, he said, that's on the far side. He goes, you shouldn't wake up every morning trying to say, how do I avoid failure and rejection? He said, you should be waking up every morning saying, how do I get a lot of failure and rejection in my life? Understanding that the failure and the rejection ultimately become the stepping stones on your way to that success. So what are we saying? We are saying that you need to develop a high NQ. Now we all know what IQ stands for, right? Intelligence quotient. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in business, doesn't matter in life. What really matters is that you develop and increase your no quotient. Your no quotient, the number of times you are willing to hear no and keep going. And when you think of the successful people that are out there and you look at the glitz and the glamour that you see on the surface, what you always find when you peel back that top layer, that outer layer, are stories of people who failed and heard no over and over and over again before they succeeded. And you look at the people that come up on stage, that win the awards, that win the trips and get the cars. These are not people sitting in their home or sitting in their office just not going out and not hearing no. They literally fail all the time. You just don't hear about it. You just hear about their successes. So you need to adopt this philosophy, this no quotient, increase that. But I want to do a little pop quiz to make sure you get the idea of what we call successful failure. So I'm going to share with you some stories of some famous people. You'll probably recognize most of these. And if you think you know who the story belongs to, just go ahead and shout out their name. So here's some successful failures in our successful failure pop quiz. As a young mother with no business experience, she was told repeatedly that her idea was crazy. No business could survive selling only cookies. Exactly, Mrs. Fields. This Oscar-winning actor credits much of his success to his belief that if you don't fail, you're not really trying. This could be a lot of actors in this case. I didn't hear it, Denzel. Yep. Held the record for home runs, 714, but also held the record for strikeouts, 2,330. What did I hear? Don't be shy, I heard it, Babe Ruth, all right. Spent two years driving across the US looking for restaurants to buy his chicken recipe. Yes. He was turned down 1,009 times. Come on, that's one heck of a high no quotient. This actress made two pilots, both of which were picked up by networks on the condition that she be replaced before she landed a role in the popular TV series Scandal. There you go. One heck of a no quotient. When asked by a reporter how it felt to fail 10,000 times, he exclaimed, I have not failed at all. I have successfully discovered 10,000 ways that do not work. <laughs> I think I heard it, Edison, yep. 
When this former sales trainer met with a patent attorney to protect her idea, he thought it was so stupid that he thought he was on candid camera. So she wrote the patent document herself. She went on to become a billionaire. Any guesses? Sarah Blakely, the billionaire founder of Spanx. Mm -hmm. Their first demo tape produced by Gene Simmons of Kiss was turned down by every major record label. Guesses? Van Halen? Writing in a small cafe with her daughter in her lap, her book was rejected by 12 publishers before she became the richest woman in the UK. I heard it here. Somebody knows their trivia down there, J.K. Rowling. Penniless in the late 1950s, he moved to LA to follow his dream after decades of struggling in theater. He almost gave up and just got his taxi driver's license. So glad he didn't, brilliant man, Morgan Freeman. Until recently, this NFL quarterback owned the record for the most wins and touchdown passes, which he achieved by owning the record for attempts and interceptions. Guesses? Brett Favre. Was told by his high school headmaster, congratulations, I predict that you will either go to prison or become a millionaire. And now he's a billionaire. <laughs> Sir Richard Branson, was turned down by 27 publishing houses and considered burning his manuscript before his first book was published. And this could be said by so many authors. In this case, so glad he didn't give up. You guys probably have read this, these books to your children. You may read them today. Who knows? This is Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss. So what is your no quotient? Now you can go to our website at Go For No. You can take this quiz yourself. We have a 20 question assessment. Take it, find out where you are, and then work with us. Learn the strategies that we are gonna share with you today to increase your no quotient. You don't get better by not getting out there and failing your way to success and increasing your opportunities by going for no. All right, so you know, it's one thing for us to come up here and tell you that, uh, you know, this is a pretty good theory. This is kind of interesting. Maybe there's a way, you know, that if you increased your nose, you might be successful. Well, you know what? This is not a theory. This is a fact. This is a proven fact. So Andrea and I thought that we would play a little game, okay? We call this the red-green game, and it's not going to be embarrassing. We do need a couple of volunteers. Andrea's gonna get a couple people and there will be a fabulous prize. We need a lady, lady. ma'am, right there in the um, black and white. I saw your hand first. Hello, I see you. No, 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 not yet. Just two, we've got the two, we've got the two. All right, come on up. Give them a round of applause, everybody, for their courage. Come on up, you two. All right, we've got our two players. Yep. Come on up. Okay. So the red-green game, this is how the red-green is, green game is played. In this black bag that I am holding, I have 20 or 20 balls. 15 of them are red, five of them are green. The goal for our first player is going to be to reach into the bag, pull out one ball, and if she gets a green ball, she wins. If she gets a red ball, she loses. So now your name is? Sylvia. Sylvia. Sylvia, come on over here. Let's have a round of applause for Sylvia. Okay, now this is not a magic trick, folks. This is a black bag with 20 balls in it. 15 are red, five are green. There's no secret compartment, okay? It's just the way I said it. Take a peek in. See, it's just the way I said? Okay, now I'm just gonna mix them up. No special thing here. Your job, Sylvia, reach into the bag, pull out one ball. If it's green, you win. If it's red, you don't. Are you ready? Yep. Without looking, hand in. Here we go, and then hold it up nice and high. Oh, oh, it was a red ball. Sylvia, you did not win the red-green game, but Andrea has a fabulous prize. We do, in fact, have a fabulous prize for you, Sylvia. Now, it is not a copy of our book, and I will tell you why that is. The book's entirely sold out. It's entirely sold out here at the event, and it's entirely sold out from us. We literally have no books, so I'm so sorry about that, but we have a great package for you. This is called the Go For No Breakthrough Pack. We always bring these to events. We sell this on our website for $167. But here at the event, it's $97. So I just need your credit card. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sylvia, just kidding. Because you were so courageous, Sylvia, you get the whole package, but let me tell you what you've won. This is our Mastering Go For No CDs. Three CDs, Richard and I in the studio, teaching Go For No to you. A personal implementation guide workbook is in there as well. Our DVD movie where Richard made me get in the car and drive 12,000 miles around the country with him so that we could interview top achievers on how to go for no. And then the reprogram how you think about no audio is the final thing. So this is a breakthrough pack for you. So congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. OK. OK. All right. All right. We're ready for our next player. And your name is? Curtis McMullen. Curtis. Curtis. For out of Chicago, as am I. Thank you, sir. How do you like that? Now, Curtis, for you, we're going to play the game a little bit differently. OK, for round two, we're going to play the game a different way. For round two, your goal is to reach into this bag, and pulling out one ball at a time is to pull all 15 red balls out of the bag before pulling out the fifth green. If you pull out the fifth green ball, you lose the game, Curtis. Your goal is to get all 15 reds. Now, when you pull the balls out of the bag, and because Curtis is trying to get red balls out of the bag, he's going to pull it out. He's going to hold it up, right? He's going to hold it up nice and high. If it's a red ball, would you please cheer? Because that's what we're trying to get. If it is a green ball, would you please boo, jeer, or hiss? OK. Curtis, I want you to reach your hand in. I want you to mix them up. I want you to make sure there's no. And then after you pull them out, you put them here. I'm going to do the count. And when you're ready, one ball at a time, hold them up nice and high. Here we go. One. Two. Three. Curtis knows what he's doing. Four. OK, Curtis, you are on a roll, man. You're at four. Ooh. OK, there's still four more green balls in there. Just avoid those other four greens, OK? Here we go. You're at four right now. Oh. There's still three greens. Just avoid the last three greens, please. <laughs> All right, five. OK, let's pick up the pace. <laughs> five. It's a one-hour program. <laughs> Six. <laughs> All right. Seven. There we go. All right. Eight. Nine. Oh, oh. OK, just avoid the last two. You're at nine. 10. Ooh. There's still one more. Just avoid the last one. You're at 10. Here we go. Make it happen. You're at 10. Oh, oh that Curtis, that's OK. But as with, the, with Sylvia, Andrea has the package for you. Yes. Congratulations, Here we go. Curtis. You did win your fabulous prize. Go for no right on your phone. Way to go. Congratulations, Thank Curtis. You. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Round of applause for Curtis, please. OK, now you are probably way ahead of us here. The reds are the no's. The greens are the yeses. The way we play the game with Sylvia is unfortunately the way that most people sell in any business in any part of the world. Somebody gets a no, and they think that no means never. And so they do not call on that person again. Or they get one yes, and they think that yes means enough. We don't need to try for any more with that person because they don't want to screw it up. They don't want to push too hard. The way we played the game with Curtis was a completely different way. We said, what if we didn't concern ourselves with trying to get the green balls out of the bag. In fact, what if we went the other way? What if we tried to not get the green balls out of the bag and we just focused on getting the red balls out of the bag? What if we could just go out of our way to increase the number of no's we're hearing, understanding that the yeses will happen automatically and they will happen when they're supposed to happen without any stress? When you go for no, the yeses will happen automatically. Now let me ask you, which is a better way, to, the better way to sell? The way we played the game the first time or the second time? We got five yeses the second time, even though we got a bunch of no's. You don't know when they're going to happen, but they're going to happen. They always do. Exactly. So this strategy, 
yeah, yeah. <laughs> this strategy of going for no, you kind of get the philosophy now. So here's something that you can implement, and you guys should implement this immediately. And that is to do what we suggest, which is to set a no goal. Now, obviously, I'm not telling you to set no goals. I'm telling you to set a goal for the number of no's that you are going to hear in a given day, week, or month. Now, this has nothing to do with your ultimate vision and where you see yourself and where you want to be. This is the day-to-day -day behavior activity that needs to be done in order to get results, and that's what no goals are. So we don't dictate what your no goal should be, um, but I will tell you for us, in our own business, we used to set yes goals like everybody. You know, we would set a yes goal of, of selling five, four or five speaking engagements. And that was our yes goal. And so we would get on the phone at the beginning of the month and we would call and email and send packages. And then sometimes we would hit our goal of, let's say, four. And then we would say, ah, we hit our yes goal. And what do you think we did with the rest of the month? We hung out. We were like, oh, this is awesome. We hit the goal. And wouldn't you know, it was fascinating that our income level, which we were always working so hard to increase, was always right where we thought it would be, right? because we were setting the goal and we were hemming ourselves in once we hit that yes goal. So then we said, okay, let's, let's change this up. We wrote go for no and we said, let's really put this into action ourselves. Let's set a no goal of 100. Let's have 100 companies say no to us each month and see what happens. Well, first of all, it was almost impossible to get to that 100, but when we did, it was amazing. We had more business then we knew what to do with, because as we were going along and getting those yeses, it was like, okay, great, got a yes, but gosh, we still have 57 no's to get. And that's the key. It keeps you in action. It keeps you on a hot streak. It keeps you from always being yes focused and then limiting your performance and limiting your activity and limiting your income potential. Who says what your yes goal has to be? Why don't you set a no goal and just see what's possible? When you do that, you tap into the behaviors necessary to get those yeses. They tend to happen more automatically. They tend to happen more stress-free. It tends to be more of a game like we played with Sylvia and Curtis. It just becomes kind of more fun. And when you are having fun and you're setting your no goals and you're just focused on your activity and what you can control, because we can't control other people, and you're out there telling your story to as many people as you can, as fast as you can, and you are collecting those no's, you know what happens? You start becoming really attractive to other people. They start saying, wow, this business is fun and pretty simple. And if I can go out there and set no goals as well, then I can achieve success. And you just keep repeating it, and you just keep doing it, and you have fun, and you make it a game. Right. <laughs> Okay, well, we're about halfway through our presentation, and what Andrew and I want to do now is we want to shift gears, and I think we've got you sold. I think we've got you on board. You don't think it's a theory anymore. You understand that this works, and this is how businesses are built. Well, we want to share some of the specific strategies, okay, that you can employ in order for you to build a business using go for no Now, on our audio program, we have 20 of them. We don't have time to do 20 today, but we're going to hit three or four of them in the time that we have. The first of these strategies that we want to share with you today is that in terms of presentations, and by that we mean sales presentations, recruiting presentations, quantity trumps quality. Quantity, meaning how many presentations you make, is more important than how well you do it. Now, we want to give you an example. Andrea and I are big basketball fans. We love basketball. And I will tell you that right now, we live here in Orlando, and to be brutally honest with you, there's not a lot to cheer about, is there? Okay, it's just not a good time for basketball in Orlando. But before we moved to Orlando, we lived in Portland, Oregon. And I've got to tell you, Portland is a great, great basketball city. Unfortunately, we lived in Portland during the Greg Oden era. And, you know, 
He is a great basketball player, but things just went wrong, and it was a time where they just didn't make it happen. But before that, we lived in Los Angeles. And we lived there during showtime. And I mean, it was a wonderful, wonderful city to live in and a wonderful time to be a basketball fan in LA. Well, as you all know, Shaquille O'Neal was one of the most dominant centers in the history of the game. But for all of his dominance, Shaquille O'Neal had one major flaw, and that flaw was free throw shooting, right? He was an atrocious free throw shooter. There are a few guys in the history of the NBA who shot 90% from the free throw line. Great players shoot 80, average players shoot 70. Shaquille O'Neal was traditionally at about 50%. He would make one out of every two free throw. And I have to tell you, when Shaquille O'Neal would get fouled, when he would get fouled, I would get up off the sofa, I would walk across the room, I would take the TV in my hands, and I would pray. And it didn't matter, because he was going to make one out of two, no matter how hard I prayed. But you know what? One day I got an idea. I said, I'm going to write a letter to the Los Angeles Lakers, and I'm going to offer to go down and teach Shaquille O'Neal how to shoot free throws. Now, you might be thinking, I'm looking at Rich. I, I just don't see how he could help this guy. How's he going to help Shaquille O'Neal? Well, here's the thing you don't know. During high school, I played one year of basketball my freshman year. I got into one game. I took one shot. It went in, which is not the point of the story, but it went in. It bounced around a few times, but it went in. But the thing was, I was the high school free throw shooting champion. I made 93 of 100 shots in a gym with 400 people looking on, right? And I have to tell you, that's pressure. But it wasn't because I was such a great basketball player, it was because I studied. I studied the technique of shooting free throws. I understood the motion. I understood everything there was to understand about shooting a free throw. And I could watch Shaquille O'Neal on TV, and in two minutes, you could see the two things that he was doing that could be corrected immediately. So I wrote Phil Jackson, I asked him if he'd let me come down, and I didn't get a reply. Shock, right? So a week later, I wrote another letter, and then another letter, and then another letter. This series of letters went on every week for over two months, until finally, one day, the Lakers wrote back. And if I can get the picture up there, you'll actually see the letter. There we go. The Lakers wrote me back. Now, it wasn't the response I was hoping for. The letter basically said, Dear Mr. Fenton, thank you very much for your concern about Shaquille O'Neal's free throw shooting situation. We want you to know that many, many Lakers fans have written us and offered to come down and lend their assistance. <laughs> and Coach Phil Jackson and the rest of the Laker coaching staff wants you to know that they are taking corrective measures and have the situation firmly in hand. P.S. Please don't write again. I get it. But I got through. I sent the letter. They wrote me back. So I quit writing. You know what happened after that? His free throw shooting percentage went down even further. Now I'm here today not to gloat or to say that I could have solved the problem, although I think I might have helped. I'm here today because I'm telling this story, and I tell this story all across the country, as an apology to Shaquille O'Neal and to Phil Jackson and to the Lakers coaching staff because I was absolutely, positively, 100% wrong. Let me show you. Case in point, this is an article from USA Today. And I'm going to read you this article, and I'm going to read every word of this article, because every word of it is important. And it's not that we're talking basketball here, because we're not. We're talking about your business. So as I read this article to you, I want you to follow along, and I want you to think, what does this have to do with me? So here's the article. 
Just getting to the line has benefits. Many an NBA game has been won or lost at the free throw line. But in these playoffs, it really doesn't matter what you do once you get there, just as long as you get there. USA Today examined team statistics to find the key to winning, and the answer brings good news for Shaquille O'Neal, because getting to the free throw line is the most important factor, and free throw shooting percentage is the least. The team that gets to the free throw line most wins 75% of the time, while the better shooting team wins only 35% of the time. Now, the reason that doesn't come to 100 is that sometimes the better shooting team is the team that shoots the most. Sometimes there's some overlap. O'Neal is shooting a dismal 41.2% from the free throw line in the playoffs, but he leads all players in getting there. Now, why did he lead all players in getting there? It was because the other teams made a strategic mistake. They said if Shaquille O'Neal gets the ball underneath the basket, don't let him lay it in. Don't let him slam dunk it on you. You foul him, right? You make him go 15 feet away and take his worst shot. They called it the hack a shack defense. You hack Shaquille O'Neal. You make him go over here and you make him take two shots. One little problem. They fouled Shaquille O'Neal so much that in some games, he got to the free throw line and took almost 40 shots a game. Now, let's just do the math together. 40 shots at a 40% success rate is 16 points. Now, you got the other guy who took five shots and he made four of them. He's got an 80% success rate, but he only put up four points. Do you want the 16 or do you want the four? That's right. This is a numbers game. Now, are we saying that you shouldn't try to learn and you shouldn't do the best you can? Of course. Quantity and quality, when they're married, okay, is a magical thing. But I'm telling you this, the worst stuttering, stammering, umfilled, screwed up presentation in the world about five links and the products and your opportunity can create magic with the right person at the right time, while the best presentation in the world will go nowhere if you don't deliver it. So true. So we would be remiss if we did not talk about um, the whole idea of your emotions and what we tend to do when we get a no. And here we are telling you guys, we're telling you, hey, this ultimately is a numbers game, the statistics are in it, you've got to stay in the game, and all of these things, you've got to get out there and hear no, and you're probably thinking, yes, I can do this, and I can set a no goal, and we want you to do all of that. But here is the tricky part, and the tricky part is your emotional reaction when it comes to hearing yes and no. And we all do it. We put ourselves on this emotional roller coaster, right? It's like you get a no and you're kind of at the top of the roller coaster, you're all excited, and or excuse me, you get a yes. <laughs> you get a yes, you're all excited, and then you get a no, and you go back down. And then you get another couple no's and you go back down. And then all of a sudden you get a yes and now you're back up the roller coaster. And now you find that you're up and down and up and down on this emotional roller coaster based on a couple things. Now we have all been taught and trained to live in what I call, what Richard and I call, a go for yes world. Where yes is good and no's are bad. And so what happens when we hear that no is we interpret a couple things. We interpret it as to what it means about us that person's no that they give you means nothing about you. It has nothing to do with you. It actually tells everything about that other person, but we personalize it. And sometimes even worse, we catastrophize it, right? Oh my gosh, I got to know I'm going to be living under the freeway overpass. That's it. It's over. One no. That's what happens. And so in order to get off of this yes, no emotional roller coaster, your reaction to yes and no needs to be of equal emotional intensity. Your reaction to yes and no needs to be of equal emotional intensity so that when you get a yes, it's great, it's fine, but it's not all the way up 
high on the roller coaster. You don't have to go crazy with the yeses. And then when you get the noes, and I noticed that our um, Tupac, our fabulous new upcoming diamond, does this, right? He celebrates those no's. So when you get those no's, that is actually when you need to celebrate. And when you do this, and when you can get yes and no on this kind of even keel, evening them out so that you are of an equal emotional intensity with not a negative reaction about no, not an overly positive reaction about yes, you get yourself in the neutral zone. And one of the mantras we love, and I know you guys probably know this, it's the SW, SW, SW mantra, right? Yes, here we go. It is, let me get this guy working here. Oh, here we go. Say it with me. Some will, some won't. Someone's waiting, someone's waiting. Now here's why this is so important. It's so important to say this mantra because some will, some won't. You can't control it. All you can do is what? Control your own behavior. Set your no goals, go out there, stay in activity, stay in action. And when you get that no, there is always someone waiting to hear your story. So no catastrophizing, no belittling yourself. Celebrate that no, celebrate that you are in activity. In fact, when you set a no goal and you hit that no goal, that's when you go out and you reward yourself. I know we all like to reward ourselves for the yeses and go out and celebrate the yeses, of course we do. But when you hit your no goal, that's when you need that reward. Because a lot of times those seeds that you're planting will come to harvest. You will reap that activity. It's just not something that you're going to reap in that moment. So when you get that no, stay positive. Stay positive in your mind, stay positive in your, in your body, stay positive in your heart, and know that the next person that you talk to needs your best. They need your best attitude, they need your excitement, they need your passion. So if you're still reeling, because you're all upset about the last no, you're not gonna give them the service that they deserve. You're not gonna give them the attention, maybe, the listening that that person deserves. So keep that in mind. Remember the mantra, some will, so what, so what someone's waiting. All right. <laughs> Good, yeah. Next core go for no concept that we wanna share with you is really important, and it's this. Never make decisions for other people as to what you think they're gonna decide, what you think they're gonna do, or how much money you think they're gonna spend. We call that prejudging. Prejudging a customer's ability to buy or willingness to spend can be the death of your business. Now let's do a little exercise here together, a little activity that I think you're gonna find kind of fun. This is called the what's a lot to spend on game, okay? What's a lot to spend on? So let's start with what's a lot to spend on dinner for two. I want you to imagine it's a nice occasion. It's a birthday. It's an anniversary. You go to your favorite restaurant. You're going to order some of your favorite food. You can have appetizers, entree. You can get the dessert. You can have a nice bottle of wine. Whatever your picture of a great dinner is, I want you to get a number set in your head. Don't share it with anybody yet. I want you to get a number set in your head as to what you think is a lot to spend on dinner for two. When you think about that amount, you think, wow, that's a lot to spend on dinner for two. I want you to take two, three seconds, get a number, lock it into your mind, whatever the first thing that pops into your head is gonna be most accurate. And now here's what I want you to do. I want you to spend the next 15 to 20 seconds sharing numbers with somebody near you. So I want you to pick somebody near you. I want the two of you to share numbers with each other. Go. Not laugh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Bring it back in, bring it back in. Now, I don't know if you noticed. I don't know if you noticed, but it was at about the 10-second mark 
where you started to hear some people laughing. And that's because people are hearing numbers that they either think are outrageously high, more than they would ever spend, or really, really low. Now, when Andrea and I have done this experiment in workshops, when we've done this in workshops with small groups, we've had people on the high end say $500, and we've had people on the low end say $50. And it's not that there's a right or a wrong answer, it's because what you think is a lot to spend on something is personal, isn't it? It's personal. It's not what other people think, it's what you think. Let's do one more. A stereo system. This would be for your house, not your car, for your home. However you define stereo system. I want you to get a number that you think is a lot to spend on a stereo system. Get that number locked into your head. Same thing, I want you to spend about 20 to 30 seconds sharing it with somebody, go. Okay, what's wrong? You keep looking at me. We're good, we're good. We're right on time. Mm -hmm. You want me to do my dad? Mm -hmm. Okay, once again, bring it back. Bring it back in. Now, when we do this in small groups, we find people who will throw out numbers on the high end, like five or $10,000, okay? And we've had people on the low end who will say 100 bucks. Once again, very personal. Now, I want to explain to you I want to explain to you why I picked these two things as the example. First off, Andrea and I love to eat out. We have a goal. Our goal is to eat in every great steakhouse in North America. When we travel, when we travel, we rip the Zagat Guide page out of the, right, out of the airline magazine. We have the Zagat Guide online. We make lists of the places we want to go to, the places we've been. You know, right? I mean, we, we collect great dining experiences the way some people collect cars. I mean, it's our thing. Now, here's the deal. When Andrea and I get to one of our great restaurants, and sometimes we've had things on the list for five years, eight years, 10 years, we finally get to a place, it is not that uncommon for us to spend three or $400 on dinner. Now, I'm not trying to tell you we do this every week. Okay, I'm not saying this to impress you. I'm telling you, this is our thing. This is what we do. This is our, our passion. And it's not really a passion. It's an obsession. This is what we love. And when we get into a great place, and they got the $85, right, prime ribeye on the bone, we're getting the best steak. We're getting a decent bottle of wine. It's just not that hard to spend that kind of money. Here's the thing. I have a friend in the city of Chicago by the name of Jay, who every time he hears how much we have spent on a dinner out, he will take that amount and he will divide it by the going rate of a Big Mac. He says, $300 for dinner. He goes, you can get a Big Mac in Chicago for $2.89. He said, I could have gotten 106 Big Macs. Because for Jay, dining out is not his thing. But when you walk into Jay's living room, he has his $20,000 Bose stereo system there. And until fairly recently, Andrea and I had a $99 Sony boombox <laughs> with the detachable speakers, right, with the little cords that still had sand on it because, it, you know, because we took it to the beach because music just wasn't our thing. But you see, if Jay took a job as the maitre d' or a wait person in a great steakhouse, you think it might be a little challenge for him to offer the $85 steak? Yeah. And if we took a job over at Bose, you think it might be a little difficult for us to recommend the $10,000 system? Yeah, but you see, if we're gonna be effective, we're gonna have to learn, because what we think is a lot of money to spend is irrelevant. That's right. 
The only thing that matters ever is what the customer thinks is a lot to spend. The numbers that you get set in your head are almost always going to limit your performance. You need to get those numbers out of your head. Just like with my suit sale, you need to let the customer spend the amount of money they want to spend. After that day with Harold, Harold said, Richard, do you know where that customer is right now? I said, no, sir, where is he? He said, he's at the other end of the mall spending the rest of the money you wouldn't let him spend with us. Now that hurt. You see, we have to get these things out of our heads so that we don't have these self-imposed limitations. Now, I have just enough time to tell you this story. Thank you. Um, we're going to squeak this story in because it's too funny not to do it. We're in the office a couple years ago now, and Andrea says, hey, I just got the, the new Norm Thompson catalog. And she said, there's a cake in there I want to get. And I said, sure, go ahead and get it. She said, well, don't you want to know what it costs first? And I'm thinking, how much could it cost? It's a cake, right? <laughs> she said, well, take a guess. Now, I thought, she's making a pretty big deal about this, right? Now, to me, a cake is worth about $20. And so I bumped it up, and I said, $35. And she said, higher. I said, $50. She said, higher. I said, $75? She said, higher. I said, do not tell me there is a cake for $100. She said, keep going. <laughs> now, I admit, it's one heck of a cake. Okay, and I'll put the picture up on the screen here. I think you'll enjoy seeing this. Let me read you a tiny bit of the description. Whimsical rosebuds, zany dots, and silly squares Dance merrily, it's like 50 bucks right there. Um, <laughs> dance merrily over this topsy turvy, 10 inch in diameter, we're talking little cake, 10 inch in diameter cake that serves 14 people. Price $180. And underneath that it says, sorry, no gift wrap. For $180, I want the cake, I want it gift wrapped, and I want somebody to come to my house and polish my car. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. $180 for a cake? But you know what? Some people are buying that cake. Because what I think is a lot to spend on a cake is irrelevant. The only thing that matters is what the customer thinks is a lot to spend on the cake. So I'm traveling around the country with this brochure, which is starting to fall apart. And I want to get a new one. So I call the Norm Thompson Company, and I get a young lady on the phone. And I said, hey, you know, I'd like to get a, new, a copy of that brochure that has the Polly Schoonmaker cake on page 24. And the woman says, oh, I'm sorry, sir. We no longer carry that cake. And I said, of course you don't. Nobody would spend $180 on the cake. She said, we have a replacement cake. It's on the cover. It's $200 now. Whatever numbers you have in your head, whatever numbers you have, you have to get them out of the way. Andrea? <laughs> exactly. So just some wrap-up questions. Yes, he's got Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so your limiting numbers, some questions to kind of challenge your thinking. What do you consider to be a lot of new customers in a single week or month? What assumptions have you made regarding a customer's ability to buy, and who have you be maybe prejudged about becoming a new representative. Prejudging and assumptions are the kryptonite to go for no. You, they cannot exist together. So at every turn, when you start to have these things come into your head, do you know what kind of thinking that is? That's go for yes thinking. Oh, I, I already know they're not going to be interested. They do this, or they do that, or they're too busy, or I know they're already taking this supplemental product, or they get some other service. No, all of those are your assumptions and that go for yes thinking that you've been taught and trained talking you out of going for no. Do not listen to any of that. Now, sometimes people 
say to us, all right, now you guys are suggesting that you know, we go for no. Um, should we be pushy? Should we be aggressive? Should we be manipulative? Absolutely not. This is always about doing a service for other people. It's always about doing things in the customer's best interest. However, we, so we're never, this is never a program about being pushy or aggressive or manipulating. No is quite frankly a perfectly acceptable answer. And if they give you a no, then you can either ask why or you can say, no problem. Can I check back with you in a few weeks or a couple of months? You, a no is a gift. There's always somewhere to go with a no. So it's never about being manipulative. It's never about being aggressive, but sometimes people say, well, what about stepping over that line? You know, I don't want to step over that line with people. Well, here's the problem with the line. The line is always invisible, isn't it? That line that you don't want to step over with someone, it's always invisible. It's somewhere around here, but we don't know. And it's different for everybody, right? Everybody has a different line. So in order to never step over the line with someone, what do most of us do? We stay way back here. Ooh, don't want to accidentally step over that line with that person. If you ever step over that line, it shows you that you're maximizing your go for no if you will, your persistence in a positive way. But if you never, I mean, if you never step over that line, then you are not maximizing those go for no opportunities. And kids do this so perfectly. Kids know the secret of go for no. And they know the secret that no doesn't mean never. No means not yet. Yes. And you only have to see kids in the grocery store, right? You see kids in the grocery store with their parents, little boy with his mom, and he's like, Mommy, I want a cookie. And she's like, no. Mommy, I want a cookie. No. Mommy, I want a cookie. <sighs> It's like, all right, just one. And then he gets rewarded for his persistence, right? I mean, you see this play out day after day. In fact, we were doing a speech in Los Angeles and we were talking about kids and their dogged persistence. You know, they, 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 never, they, they never let their attitude go down, right? It's like, if they want a cookie, they don't think like, nah, looks like she's not giving me a cookie today. It's, looks like I'm gonna have to do something creative to do, get a cookie today. I'm gonna have to change things up a little bit, right? So we were doing this, um, this exact presentation in Los Angeles, and a good friend of ours said, oh my gosh, you guys, you guys have to see the book that my daughter Hadley wrote. You guys would love it. It's right up your alley. And he actually sent Here's us a copy. And um, here's the book on the screen. This, I have actually the copy that Hadley wrote. This is many years ago now. We, Hadley was a kid, so we, we, uh, she was about six, I think, at the time. We bought the rights from her for this book for $100. And I'm going to read this book to you because this is go for no in the eyes of a child with that positive persistence. It's called One Day I Asked My Daddy for a Cookie by Hadley, also illustrated by Hadley. And it goes like this. One day I asked my daddy for a cookie, but my daddy didn't let me have a cookie. So I asked for a cookie, but he didn't let me have a cookie. So I asked for a cookie, but he didn't let me have a cookie. So I asked for a cookie, he let me have a cookie, the end. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's what we're talking about. So this is not a, go for no is never a tool for evil. It is only a tool for good. You are always doing something in the customer's best interest, but most of the time, because we've been taught and trained to live in a go for yes world, we always hem ourselves in. We, all, we never step over that line because we never want to take the chance. We never want to risk because we're always playing it just a little too safe. The persistent statistics, though, bear this out. I want to share these with you. You guys will absolutely love these. And by the way, um, we were backstage with your founders and you know, one of them said to me, he said, um, you know, you guys have been sending me stuff for five years. We have been trying to get on this stage for five years. <laughs> and big, huge thanks to Tupac, who's been championing Go For No. He's been a great Go For No champion and has implemented with his teams and has seen great results because he is a, a, a leader and he's obviously getting rewarded for that. So persistent statistics, 44% of all people give up after getting the first no. They hear a no and they think, okay, that's it, I'm done. 22% more give up after the second no. 14% more give up after getting the third no. 12% more give up after the fourth no, which means that 92% of people 
give up before getting that fifth no. So they're not sticking around, they're not staying in the game. But here's the irony, 60% of all customers say no four times before finally saying yes. So you ask yourself, right? Yeah, persistent statistics, hard to say. You ask yourself, how do I get in the top eight to 10%? How do I go on the trips? How do I win the awards? How, do I, how, do, how am I gonna live the life of my dreams? You've got to stay in the game long enough to have those numbers pay off for you. Stay in the game. Let me hear you say it. Stay in, in the, the game. game. Don't give up. Most people give up way too soon. Right. When we started this program, Andrea and I asked you three questions. I'm going to ask you one of those questions one more time. Can we see a show of hands of those of you who would like to hear the word no more often? Woo! All right, then I think our work here has done it. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.